Hi, everyone. Um, in honor of Women's History Month, I'm here with Ann Sophie, our Edgewell's Chief Strategy and Growth Officer, and Marissa, uh, Edgewell's Chief Legal Officer. I'm Karen Anderson. I lead Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Edgewell, and I'll be moderating our discussion today. Marissa and Ann Sophie, I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time today to talk with us. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for uh, having us. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I think the question everybody's most curious about to start off, maybe we could say, um, talk a little bit about um, a short overview of your careers. What was the path like for you both to get to where you are today? Um, Marissa, maybe if you can go first. Sure. Um, so I always like to describe my career path as a little bit of a, a scenic route. Um, I started in private practice out in Southern California. Um, I don't want to say how many years ago. Um, and just worked primarily as a mergers and acquisitions lawyer and SEC reporting lawyer. Uh, but I knew from the beginning of my career that I didn't want to stay in a law firm world and, and be a, a law firm partner. And so um, after about 10 years of that, I decided uh, now I'm going to actually take the leap and go in-house um, and moved to a small company in Greeley, Colorado, um, and was there for about a year, uh, serving as their assistant general counsel, and then uh, moved with the general counsel to um, a company based in Stanford, Connecticut, was there for about 10 years, started off as a junior lawyer, worked my way up to general counsel uh, over about 10 years, and then about three years ago, I, I joined Edgewell. Great. Hey, we're so glad that you did. Um, Anne Sophie, can you tell us a little bit about your career path? Sure. So I started my career um, nearly 30 years ago. So yesterday, um, I spent my first 10 in marketing category management positions in France, in Europe, uh, sometimes running global projects. Um, then I, I think at that time I joined my first market leadership team. I was uh, around 27. I became the uh, general manager of France at the time of the Energizer and uh, personal care merger. I was in my mid 30s and then progressively evolved as the regional leader for all the South Europe business, uh, Middle East and Africa affiliates and teams. And since uh, four years, I've moved to uh, global positions. So to get us started, um, perhaps we can talk a little bit about work, work life balance. I know that's a topic that uh, everyone struggles with from time to time. Um, Anne Sophie, can you talk to us a little bit about how you balance work and life? Uh, so um, how do I balance work uh, and, and uh, personal life? Um, I've been lucky to become a mother and educate two kids over this time uh, while doing extremely well. Um, they are my best pride, I would say. Um, so yes, the work-life balance is a fundamental question for women in, the, in their thirties with kids under, I would say the age of eight, 10 uh, at home uh, because they have not gained uh, enough autonomy. And that was critical at that time. Um, I want to say a couple of words here. I think uh, we are all here together because we, we believe that the work environment needs to become more gender balanced, but the same needs to happen at home. Uh, women need the balanced organization in the two streams of their life. Uh, a working woman needs to feel good with the idea that she's a great mother, even if she works, at no guilt, no doubt, and feel super confident that She's bringing home a super rich experience for her work, um, which will greatly, I think, inspire the kids in the family. And my last trick, uh, I have on top of my computer um, a note saying, um, better done than perfect. Um, I think women lacks confidence. We tend to be overprepared in everything we do to chase perfection. So better done than perfect. That's how I manage it. <laughs> Thank you for that. I agree with you on a couple of fronts for sure. Um, I, I just like to layer very, yeah. very quickly on that. I think, you know, I can appreciate how parents have that, that struggle with um, the work-life balance, but I think that's true even more broadly for everyone. Right. Um, and I think we all struggle with finding 
as women trying to find the balance between things you touched on this and Sophie, feeling like you need to be overprepared and always like, you know, perfect, right? I think that's something that we women just inherently feel like we have to do to be successful. Um, and so we do work hard, not always, but we work hard, we work long hours um, to get ahead. And I think it's also a struggle for those of us like myself who don't have children, but do find a very, um, have a difficult time finding that balance in the work and the, the life, the, hard, the, the work and the personal life. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a struggle, it's a struggle, yeah. but um, it, it comes with building self-confidence or mm-hmm. confidence in oneself. And that's not something we have in our genes. No, nope. for whatever reason. Um, so yes, uh, we we need to be mindful of that. This question is for Marissa, um, especially given what you just talked about. So, what are you most proud of? Um, you know, you're a very successful uh, woman in, um, you know, a wonderful company, if I may say so myself. But what would you say that you are most proud of? I take probably the the one element of my my role that I take um, very seriously is developing my team. And for me, seeing my team succeed and excel and and move up, um, you know, being promoted or taking on bigger opportunities, for me, that's something that I'm very proud of is when I see the success of um, my team. Uh, So that's always been something that I've it's always been like, wow, you know, I helped support someone in their development um, and in their success. So Anne Sophie, were there any notable experiences in your career when you realized uh, gender equality isn't where it should be? Uh, well, do I have uh, one minute or 10 minutes? Uh, <laughs> you have 10. <laughs> <laughs> so first I want to say that I've, um, I felt always very good in the companies I worked with and um, at Edgewell in particular. Um, when I became a leader, um, I had um, a male direct report and um, it happened sometimes that I experienced difficult situation when some men had difficulty to be led by a woman. Um, they believed that that was making them maybe less credible in front of their own team. So that has forces me to really open the dialogue up front to create um, um, a, a trusty environment, to chase for the blind spot, to raise up the unsaid, and, and to define new ways of working, really questioning myself what I would bring to them. Um, I think their resistance may be better. Um, and I, probably one of my best achievements was to, re- to hear several of them spontaneously saying, and sharing that they had a lot of privilege and that the experience together ended, ended up being um, one of their most enriching one of their business life. I think like Anne-Sophie, I, you know, they're more like small experiences, not like one big aha kind of a, oh, you know, that was a terrible experience, but it, it was little things like, you know, being held to slightly different standards uh, in terms of how, as a female, you should behave in the workplace, right? Uh, I'm, I'm just a very high energy person to start off with, um, almost always with a smile on my face, and that's just the way I am. And it's, but you know, I think occasionally that has led to people either not taking me seriously or misjudging, misjudging me. Um, and I think, you know, that that kind of there's a trickle effect to that. And you feel like maybe you need to overcome that, right? And so sometimes that's that's like, you feel like you can't, this is uh, you know, a very uh, important thing, but like you can't be authentic sometimes. You have to put on this persona because otherwise people won't take you seriously. And so I think that to me is maybe a, a little bit of a theme that runs through some of these negative experiences that I've had, where it's like you have to sort of overcome um, this perception that um, you needed to behave a certain way because you're female um, and uh, to be taken seriously. What What's one thing that people get wrong about women? Marissa, we'll stay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, just that, one. But this is a tough one because I think 
I'll, you know, there are a couple of things that came, that come to my mind anyway. Um, for example, women are risk averse or women are um, non-confrontational maybe as another way, you know, another thing that they, we don't, we don't, we don't like to fight. We don't like to argue, at least not in the work environment, putting aside the, the personal, the personal environment. Right. Um, you know, they like, they like for things to be calm and nice. And, and, and I don't think, I don't think that's true. I think that's, that's a misperception of women. I mean, I think there are some women who thrive on conflict, just like there are some men who thrive on it. Um, but I do think there's, I think that is one, I would say that uh, one thing that uh, generalization about women that people get wrong. And Sophie, what women, what women's themes do you believe we still need to have greater awareness around? Um, I think helping women in their thirties. Um, I think it's a time where the company needs to care, protect, uh, listen to them. Uh, it's, they are the leaders of tomorrow. And uh, we know the 30s are pivoting age uh, for success uh, in a professional career. And it's the period of time where also the men are evolving very fast in their career. So I think if we want to have more women in management teams, this period is critical. For me, it's also a question to really listen to the unsaid. So it's totally aligned with, with our values on speak up and listen up is we need to chase for all the blind spots. Um, we need to adapt our leadership style to care for the gender and cultural differences. Uh, we know women like confidence. Um, we know that they won't speak openly about their frustrations or about their ambition. Um, so how do we adapt our style to, to help them speak up? Do you think it's harder for women just starting out or is it harder as a senior? Executive. <laughs> What's the good answer here? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, I would say it's it, it, it's harder to start with. I think it's maybe also society in general has evolved. Yeah, uh, but but I think because of the work life balance, the fear of missing out on, on essential um, kids and teenagers activities. So uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, so for sure, the start is hard. At the more senior level, I think the confidence has built up. Uh, also, the networks has increased. So uh, we know how to get supported, how to where to find advice. So um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's hard, um, getting better, but still hard. It's funny. I I think when I look through the lens of um, my profession, lawyers, I think today it's a lot easier for women in the, as they're starting their career, I think their law firms have really set up themselves to attract uh, talent and to retain talent in, in, in a variety of different ways and, and giving women the opportunity to progress up the partnership track as they call it in, in the law firm world. And I think that's true even for, um, you know, even when you move in house, I personally, I think it's, it's probably, the middle towards the senior levels where it becomes more of a struggle for women. Um, it's partly related to if a woman takes time off to have, a, have a family and that kind of holds you back or delays your progression, or there may be this perception that you're not interested in moving up the ladder, right? Because you have a family or, you know, it's the top of the pyramid, right? There are fewer and fewer opportunities as you go up the top of the pyramid and, um, so I think it's definitely much more difficult as a senior, as a senior, uh, female executive than it is when you're starting out. That's, that's at least today. I think it would have been different at the beginning of my career. It's getting easier, but it's still a challenge. So let's transition to Edgewell. Where do you think Edgewell needs to succeed to support gender equality? So I think we have, uh, gender equality in our DNA. I think the Anglo-Saxon culture <laughs> has been quite progressive on this. And while well, maybe it's a, a French perspective to this, but, um, and I do think also Hedgewell has the set of value to take that uh, very seriously. Uh, I'm super delighted that the um, ELT 
acknowledge uh, that it is not perfect yet and, and, and uh, has decided to be part of the leading company on this question. Uh, and it's a very genuine ambition. Um, the equation is, is, is more complex um, uh, and, and there is more, uh, the, there is the other lens of diversity. Yeah? It's, it's different to be a woman in, in France, in Germany, in Japan, in China, in the US, maybe in California and in, in Connecticut. Yeah? So um, there's a lot to do, uh, also to adapt to, to the cultural differences. Marissa, where do you uh, believe that we have opportunities uh, to support it better? We're all humans. We all have these unconscious biases, right? And I think whether, whether or not we, we think that we do, right? Um, and I think it's, it's, it's teaching people how to over, overcome that, how to address that. And so, you know, I think you know, to Anne Sophie, I think you hit the nail on the head about the Edgewell culture really is one that I think we 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 do embrace doing the right thing. You know, we do want to listen up and speak up. That's why we're 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 launching, you know, we've launched the DEI initiative. Um, we're hungry to sort of um, make progress in this area. And then to your point, Anne Sophie, it's not just about gender, it's about a whole host of other other things too, right? And uh, but I think it really starts with having a dialogue and opening that up and giving people that space uh, to feel safe to have that conversation. Yeah, I agree. Everyone absolutely should certainly take a, their own journey on DEI. And, and it's certainly not one person's job. It's everyone's job. So I, I agree completely. Um, so one other question, slightly different. Knowing what you know now, <laughs> if you could tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? What advice would you give yourself? Um, never let someone give you bad conscience. You will be a good mother. Um, <laughs> and the second one is dare to hem high state. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, dare to be ambitious and, and, and dare to say it. Um, women num sometimes don't share that. Yeah. Um, and the one which is more um, personal, I would say, um, I think I, I became a, a better leader when I found the balance between my masculine and feminine energy. Um, so the feminine energy, um, men and women have them in themselves. And I, and I do think that uh, um, the feminine energy is critical to change our world, you know, to, to develop a sentiment of sharing versus owning, of, to remove the silo thinking, to some put self-esteem on the side, bring empathy in. Uh, so it's in every, it's in every one of us, men and women. Uh, I think having a gender balance organization will help to accelerate this. I, I would say I wholeheartedly agree with you, Anne Sophie, about being authentic and being true to yourself. That would be one piece of advice I would give my younger self if I could go back. Um, and you hit the, the nail on the head too for another one for me is that don't expect people to hand you things on a silver platter. If you want something, express it. Don't be afraid to express it. There's, um, uh, you know, I feel like sometimes ambition is, has become a dirty word for women and it shouldn't be. There's nothing wrong with being ambitious and, and being vocal about it. And, um, you know, you should speak up, right? And um, so I think that would be something else that, that I would have told my younger self. And, um, you know, the other, the other one I would say is don't wait, don't stay in a situation just because you're comfortable. Um, you know, when you know it's not the right situation for you, right? Like staying in a job for too long, just because you're comfortable and you don't want to make a move. Sometimes you have to break out of your comfort zone to go to the next level or to even just be happy. It's great advice. <laughs> and really, um, for sure. Um, unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have for today. I just want to say uh, thank you so much, Marissa and Anne Sophie, for your time. I personally found the conversation so engaging and uh, really appreciate you sharing your experiences and your advice with me and for everyone else to see. <laughs>